My favorite part of the morning so far is uh, sitting in silence reflecting on a colonoscopy. (laughs) Yeah, thanks actually, Andy, for lightening the mood and for also, you know, leading us into this uh, in this terrain. I was a little worried about today's talk. I mean, last time I last time I was here, I talked about the father wound. Today, I want to talk about trauma. It's like, ooh, (laughs) yeah, come to C three. That sounds fun. Um, Yeah, so. Um, yeah, where do I want to start, really? I think, let, well, let me just start with one of the quotations that, that's on your, on your bulletin. Let's, let's read it. Uh, I'm going to start with the second one, which is uh, from Peter Levine. He says, trauma is perhaps the most avoided, ignored, belittled, denied, misunderstood, and untreated cause of human suffering. So, so if he's right, then I think we ought to be talking about it. We ought to find ways to talk about it. Just, I mean, listen to that. That's quite a claim. Trauma is perhaps the most avoided, ignored, belittled, denied, misunderstood, and untreated cause of human suffering. So, um, yeah, so we're in a series called We Have Questions. And, I mean, today my question is kind of straightforward. What do we mean by trauma? Because if uh, Peter Levine is correct here, and this is a major cause of human suffering, well, uh, uh, we as a spiritual community to be wrestling with it in some way. Is, don't we have an opportunity to wrestle with it in some way? But in order to do that, we also have to try to say what, what we mean by it. And that's difficult. That's difficult. It's not as easy as, as it first sounds to say trauma is fill in the blank. And I, I will try to get to some definitions. Um, but first, I want to make an observation and then a caveat about what, what we're going to do, what I'm going to do this morning, what I'm going to subject you to. Um, so here's the, here's the, here's an observation. First of all, my, my wife had a dream a couple of months ago, and she said I could use this part of her dream. And in the dream, she was in an ancient library, and a little leprechaun came up and told her, stay away from the, psych- the psychology section. <laughs> <laughs> Now, of course, I'm really into dream work, and, and I'm not going to, we won't, we, we won't go deep here, and, and this would be really, you know, for my wife to say what the dream is about for her. Um, but I'm just, I'm stealing that one image, because it's kind of a cultural warning right now. One of the things I like to do is pay attention to what kind of language people are using, like, what are common phrases and, that are floating around, and for a long time, they were more mechanized phrases in language, like people would say that they're wired in a certain way or programmed to do this, and they need to be rewired. That's all computer mechanistic language. So it tells you that the dominant culture is influencing the way we think about things. But there's been a shift lately. I mean, people still talk like that. And the shift is toward the psychologization, if that's a word, of language. Everybody's using psychology terms right now, like really basic ones, extrovert, introvert. Let's say, well, my introversion means I'm not going to go to your party or whatever, or I'm just doing that because I'm extroverted. These are, these, this comes straight out of Jungian typology. And how is it that all of a sudden it's being used in such broad ways? And I'm, by the way, I'm not saying this is bad. I'm just saying the leprechaun might have a point here. <laughs> and, and I made a list of other ones here. Um, sort of everyday speech. Where's my list here? Uh, okay, here, here it is. Um, Phrases like, I'm triggered, okay, I'm triggered. Well, that's, that has a couple of meanings, but usually most people mean that in a psychological sense. Um, they'll say, my trauma, my trauma this or my trauma that. Uh, that's interesting. Um, uh, somatic feeling, that's a, that's, a, that's a phrase common in circles that I'm in. Um, uh, so-and-so is being pathological, and they might even state the pathology, as if they are like have the DSM in front of them and say, let's see, Donald Trump here. Where is narcissist? You know, here we go. You know, we're flipping for it. But anyway, we're just we're very used to that. And actually, it feels like everybody is is becoming an expert in in psychology. And I use a lot of psychological language too, primarily because of my my interest in Jung. Um, here are other things people say. I'm doing shadow work. I'm working on my shadow. Like I didn't hear people talking like that ten years ago. I didn't, at least. Uh, my inner child needs this or that, you know, all straight out of the broad realm of, of psychology. And, and, of course, the diag- diagnosing is of everyone, um, like they're a narcissist or whatever, you fill in the blank. Um, the number of friends that have told me, 
that they for sure know that their dad particularly is a narcissist. I just think this is interesting. Um, so anyway, I think, well, I mean, if we take, well, psychology, psyche is a Greek word, of course, and there's, it goes all the way back to the ancient world, but in its modern iterations, it's 100 years old. So it's, it's new on the scene, you could say, and it's really taking, it's really working itself into, into common language. And um, so that's just my observation, obs observation number one, and to hear the warning of the leprechaun, all right, <laughs> which is stay away from the psychology section. So I'm saying that, like, I want to talk about trauma, but I also <clears throat> don't want to pretend that I'm an expert and pretend that whatever I'm going to say is the way it should be. We're sort of um, in terrain that needs some sensitivity and time and nuance, and we can just kind of take small steps. Sound fair? Here's the caveat. Um, talking about trauma is not the same thing as working on it. I just feel like I have to say that. Like, <laughs> although we'd love it to be. Yeah, I went to a, I, li I listened to a TED Talk. <laughs> Done. I'm untraumatized, you know. Um, and defining it will not heal it. Defining will not heal it. And, and we could even wonder, well, what do we mean by healing? And that's actually a really good question. That's maybe for another time. I already admitted I'm not an expert, but it does come up in the work that I do, like in the one-on-one -on -one guiding. It comes up in wilderness programs. If you take people outside and you ask them to fast for four days and do three nights solo in the wilderness, that's, a, that's a, an extended fast, a wilderness fast, things are going to come up. <laughs> and so, yeah, it comes up. And um, so it's been a part of my training, and, but I would consider myself a, a beginner in the conversation. I'm here to learn. But if Levine is right... Uh, that this is one of the most neglected dimensions of human suffering, then I think we have some responsibility to be in conversation with it. Okay. So, like, <laughs> I guess the best place to start in terms of trying to work toward a definition, because remember my question is, what do we mean by trauma, is to say what it isn't. All right? Now, I have some resources here. That, that have influenced me. You have Bessel van der Kolk, you have um, Peter Levine, you have Gabor Matai, his very well-known book, and, and it's a must-read in, at least in my view, The Myth of Normal, and another guy named Donald Kalshed who has a book called Trauma and the Soul. Those are my major resources, and then I like uh, other minor ones, but that's kind of what I'm drawing from. So... Um, what it is not, and, and these specific phrases I got straight from Gabor Mate. Here's what it's not, content warnings. You know, familiar with content warnings? Okay, like be warned, I'm about to talk about trauma, so therefore I've said that you won't be traumatized. Okay, not really the realm of trauma from a technical point of view. Um, or saying that I went to a movie and it triggered me, it triggered my trauma. He would say probably not trauma, and we'll get to why in a second. Or so-and-so used the wrong words. And those words triggered me and activated my trauma, the, the use of wrong words. Now, that's not impossible, by the way, but he's saying not the, not the realm of trauma, typically. By the way, all these things are what most people mean when they're talking about trauma. So I think that's an interesting observation. Here's another example. Politicians you don't like <laughs> aren't creating trauma. Okay? We say, well, yes, they are. Well, just put a little question mark by that. In other words, the way people are using trauma right now is anything that is distressful to an individual, anything that causes stress or discomfort or things I don't like is now trauma. That's why the leprechaun is saying, stay away from the psychology section because we're lumping everything together. Well, I saw so-and-so had a shirt on and they said this. You know, they had a red hat on and I was near them in the checkout line. Probably had a gun with them too, you know. And then I just was uncomfortable, therefore I'm traumatized. You say, oh, we have to be careful. And of course, this is, um, I've mentioned this book before, and so did um, Michael DeWild, The Coddling of the American Mind. This is about the college campuses and, and lots of language on the college campus right now about being triggered and trauma and activation and safe spaces. And we want to make sure in a college environment, you're never one time exposed to anything that you don't like. That's an education. So that's, that's, he, that's, that's what the authors of this book are saying. That's the trajectory of the train right now. So 
So anyway, I'm picking on some of this stuff. So all those things I just mentioned, Matei calls stress. And stress is real. How many of you feel stressed? Okay. How many are stressed that I ask that anyway? You know, and like have to raise their hand. Yeah, okay, so stress is real. And all those things I just mentioned do cause stress. Movies you didn't like or, or whatever, phrases or words, yes. But is it trauma? Um, not technically. We'll get to that in a second. At least that's the claim. Um, okay, here's point number two. I have two points in what it is not. Point number two is it's not the wound itself. The wound itself is the wound. And sometimes you're aware of the wound and sometimes you're not aware of the wound. But I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I'm sure you can think of a time in life where you were wounded. Okay? And what we want to say about that is that's a wound. That's a blow. That's a, a loss of some sort. That's acute and real and, and happened to you and, it's, and it happened at a certain point in time. And what the experts are saying is that also is not trauma. That's interesting because we would like to say, well, that's the trauma. So-and-so hurt me, or this happened, and that's the trauma. He's saying, not quite. That's the wound. So I'm inviting you, if you walk away with anything today, walk away with that, that there's a distinction between the trauma, which I'll now define, and the wound itself. Have I made sense so far? Okay. Uh, so what is it? <laughs> I'll, now I'll read from, from um, Mate, which we already heard once, which was perfect. Here we go. What is trauma? Let's look at the, the bulletin here. What is trauma? As I use the word trauma, as I use the word, trauma is an inner injury, an inner injury, a lasting rupture or split within the self due to difficult or hurtful events. Do you hear the distinction? There are hurtful events, things that happen. But the trauma, he's saying, is the inner injury and the split that happens because of those events, you could say. By this definition, trauma is primarily what happens within someone as a result of the difficult or hurtful events that befall them. Okay, so you have the event, and then you have what happens in someone. And what happens in someone is the thing they're still carrying. Does that make sense? Trauma is not what happens to you, but what happens inside you is the way I formulate it. I think this is a great gift to the conversation, what he's saying here. It helps us calm down a little bit, and it helps us to be way more curious because it's one thing to talk about wounding events or wounds themselves. It's quite another thing to say, what happened because of that? What was that split, and what's now hap happening as an operating system for people? Okay, so... It's not what happened, but what's happening is another way of saying it. And this is a phrase I got from, from Calshed, which I think is uh, particularly potent. He says, trauma is the self-care system. That's what he calls it. The self-care system that seeks to protect us from further injury. All right, so let's say something happened to you, an event. And because of that event, or in the fires of that event, a split happened. A separation happened. And one part of you was cut off from another part. I'll say more about that in a moment. But a split occurred, and you live in one world, and that world becomes self-protective so that this will never happen to you again. It's, it's an unconscious conclusion that the psyche draws because none of us like being hurt. It's part of a survival mechanism. It's not like, oh, I got hurt. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger or whatever, you know. It doesn't always work like that because it's like a shield comes up and says, especially when you're young, primarily I'm talking, the, the realm I'm in more has to do with early childhood traumas right now. But this layer comes up and says, this will never happen to you again. And you're not even aware that that's happening. And that's the self-care system. So when we're talking about trauma, that's such an interesting way of putting it. It's a way, it's a defense mechanism that saves your life. All right? If it didn't happen, you would be so psychologically, um, what's the right phrase for it, fragmented, you couldn't have, um, you wouldn't be able to function in society. And that happens to some people because of severe wounds. So the self-care system comes up. And, and what Matei is saying and most other people who are experts is that that's trauma. Okay? 
It's that operating system. And that's what, that's what needs focus and attention and care and time and compassion and time. I'll just repeat time because it's not a weekend retreat. As much as I would like to say, by the end of this talk, it'll all be taken care of. It just doesn't work that way. All right? So we're talking about things that take a long time. Okay, that's, I'm going to say something else about the split here. Okay, the self-care system, or let me back up. When we're wounded, what makes the wound so potent is that we're wounded in places that we're vulnerable. It's kind of like an obvious thing to say, but you wouldn't be wounded if you were not vulnerable, you know? So areas that were vulnerable and innocent is the area where we're most likely to be struck by the blow. So you're wounded in the way that you're wounded, but you're wounded in very vulnerable places. So the self-care system comes along and says, I think I'll protect this area of vulnerability. And most of the time, mean, that means you'll not have access to it. You won't feel your own innocence and vulnerability and sensitivities. You'll be protected from feeling that. Because if you're protected from feeling that, you're protected from further injury. So that's really, I think, a more sophisticated way of thinking about trauma. Okay, here's a point number two. So I'm trying to say, what is it? Well, no, first thing I've said is, it's not what happened to you, but what's happening. That's the operating system. The second thing I want to say it has more to do with vulnerabilities. And here's a, here's a famous uh, Zen saying. Um, there's a hole waiting for the boar's tusk. I just love Zen sayings, by the way, because you're not really supposed to follow them with explanation. I should just walk away. That would be the end of my talk. Okay, there's a, there's a hole waiting for the boar's tusk. So what that means, now I'll try to interpret it, is everybody is vulnerable in certain ways. All right, that's the hole. Okay? And here's an, here's an even more pleasant way of putting it, and I think a more nuanced way of putting it. Everyone is uniquely sensitive in certain ways. And if you go back to your childhood self, that's when you were um, the most, uh, what was the right way of saying it? Innocently, you, you had a more innocent relationship with your sensitivities. Because you're not trying. You're just a kid. You're sensitive in certain ways. You're sensitive to certain things, certain experiences. And if you follow this to the conclusion of the Zen saying, that's where you're going to get struck. Okay? There's a hole waiting for the boar's tusk. So the boar's going to show up one day, could be in the form of mom or dad or a bully or an event out of your control, and boom, it's going to hurt right there, wherever that, wherever that sensitivity is. Now, the reason why I'm, I'm sort of like slowing down here and want to emphasize this as a point is that trauma work, in a way, isn't just dealing with past wounds and isn't just dealing with the operating system, our coping strategies. It's also recovering our sensitivities. Because when the shield comes up and says, don't feel like this anymore, don't be vulnerable like this anymore, we also lose those sensitivities. We're cut off from them. We're cut off from that kind of wild innocence. Have I made sense? So one of the reasons why it's so important is not just because it's a form of human suffering, it's so that you can recover your core sensitivities, the way you relate to the world, your unique relationship, way of relating to the world. Okay, that's my two-part definition of what it is. Um, okay, some distinctions. This comes from Mate. He says there, well, actually, I think it's um, Levine that comes up with these phrases, but you may have even heard them. Big T trauma and little t trauma. Now, there's something I don't like about that because you can always say somebody had it, more, had it worse than I had it, right? Like let's say you're getting close to your own wounds or your own strategies or something like that. You can always say, well, you know, I'm not a kid living in, in Syria right now, so, you know, get over it. So I don't know. There's something, the big T, little t, but here's what's helpful about it. So... Big T trauma, I'll just read you a direct quote. Terrible things happen to vulnerable, vulnerable people that shouldn't have occurred. That's big T trauma. Terrible things happen to vulnerable people 
that should not have happened to them. So most psychotherapists say that's big T trauma. Like what? Well, like the kind of things that you can imagine, like abuse or serious neglect or violence or war. Nobody chooses these things, should not be happening to young people, and they happen anyway, and that's big T trauma. And by the definition I'm using, what happens to that innocent kid is some kind of layer that can show up in all kinds of a myriad of ways says, I'm going to protect you from this. I'm going to protect you from feeling this kind of vulnerability. You wonder, like, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen images of, of kids playing in war zones. You think, how is that happening? Well, it's happening because of that system that comes in. It's saving their life in a way. But if that continues then for the rest of their life, there's some great losses. Okay, so that's big T trauma. Little T trauma, which I think is um, maybe uh, more of what needs to be talked about in our culture, is are things like this. The prevalent misfortunes of childhood. <laughs> the prevalent misfortunes of childhood can cause little T trauma or traumas, that, that response. Like what, you might ask? Like bullying. Bullying is very serious to the, to the psyche. Very ser- It's as serious as a war zone because from the psyche's point of view, it is a war. Even though you'd say, what's a little teasing? You know, what's a little teasing? Come on. Well, I don't know if you would say that, but people might respond that way. Or poor parenting. I don't know. I mean, my parents were 100% pure and never made any mistakes, so... I know I'm in the minority here, but just poor, I'm not even talking about bad parenting, but poor parenting to the innocent, developing childhood psyche that can, uh, trauma can enter. Because there's going to be a wound, and the self-care system that gets erected in the place is, um, you know, what will happen. Or lack of emotional connection with parents, or even good things not happening, like, not just bad things, but let's say good things that never happened. Like, well, my parents never celebrated my birthday, you know, or something like that. And, you just, and somebody says that in passing. Like, I don't, I'm not really into birthdays. My parents never celebrated it. And you know, I don't see what the big deal is going on and on, lighting those candles and saying, well, happy birthday, you know, whatever. See, that's the system coming in. I'm just making up an example. But it's saying, see, there's a wound there. And then the operating system says, you shouldn't get close to this. You shouldn't get close to this. So you're not close to it. And you're like, I don't really care about birthdays, you know? Anyway, I don't, <laughs> this is just a random example that popped into my head. Or lack of acceptance. Um, or wounding dynamics in a household. Let's say your parents weren't particularly, like, aggressive or violent or abusive, but they fought constantly. And they kind of left you out of it, but the dynamics over time, you didn't know how to be in a room. Well, that has a very serious effect on, on, a, on a child. Or if there's constant numbing or drinking or whatever going on in a house, then the psyche is going to go, let's protect you from further vulnerability here. And then all kinds of strategies come up out of that. So Besser Vanderkolk says, Bessel Vanderkolk says, uh, trauma is when we are not seen and known. That's small t trauma, when we're not seen and known. Like your actual raw experience as as a child your sensitivities, your vulnerabilities, your outlook, your way of being isn't seen or known, then trauma is likely to happen. Okay, so both of these examples, big T or little t, are both a fracturing of the self. A split happens. The self-care system comes online. The split says, you'll never feel vulnerable in that way again. I'm going to separate you out from that and it rushes in to keep us from being hurt again. And if this goes on for too long or rules the personality, see, it's going to go on, period, as part of, um, I think, the general consensus of the psychological community that this happens to everybody, but how lasting this ef- effect is, well, that's um, you know, for the therapist's office, I suppose. Uh, but if it goes on for a long time, then we start to lose connections with family, friends, the world, and our inner life. We're so split that we can't feel our own inner life and our family relationships suffer, our work life suffers, our families suffer. We don't know how to have real friendships. 
No wonder, Levine says, trauma is perhaps, perhaps the most avoided, ignored, belittled, denied, misunderstood, and untreated cause of human suffering. Okay, two more pieces here. I want to tell two stories, two myths, and um, then offer like a, a way to climb, I don't know, a ladder <laughs> down in the hole that we're in right now to maybe climb out of it just a little bit. So two stories. So first of all, if trauma is a major cause of human suffering, I don't think we discovered it like five years ago. All right? It's not like, oh, yeah, now, now we know what this is. We would expect to find it in the world's great spiritualities and religious traditions and myths. So I want to tell you two myths that are related. Okay, <laughs> this is a fun one. Um, so Kronos was the father of Zeus. Okay, now Kronos had many children. Zeus, I think, was number five in line here. And Kronos is where we get words like chronological. All right, it's the chronological. In Greek, there are two versions of time, Kairos and Kronos. Kronos is chronological time. And the thing with Kronos, the thing about Kronos, the father of Kronos here, is that he eats his children. Okay, that's one of his like pastimes. He eats his children because he heard a prophecy that said, one day, one of your children will overthrow you. So he's like, well, I can prevent this. And so he eats each one of them, all right? Now you say, that's weird. Okay, remember, uh, myths are symbolic terrain about what the world is really like and what the psyche is really like. And if you even think about your own fatherhood, you might wonder about something like this. Did my dad in some way devour my childhood? You know, okay, now we're talking. Okay, so these myths weren't just like a bunch of made-up random stories, how silly. They were trying to think about how the world started. No, it was much more sophisticated than that. All right, so, and you could even say, if, here's, a, here's a, uh, uh, maybe a, a fun way of saying it. Does the patriarchy, the rule of the father, eat children up, eat innocence and wonder because they're afraid of being overthrown? Okay, I'd say, huh, that's interesting. All right, so Kronos eats his children. So Zeus is born. And he has a divine birth and whatever, special birth. And um, Rhea, his mother, says, I'm going to prevent Zeus from being eaten because I think he might be the child. He might be the chosen one that will one day overthrow Kronos. And uh, so she wraps a stone in swaddling clothes. I'm not making this up, by the way. Lays him to the side. And Kronos says, ah, there's Zeus and eats the stone instead, but doesn't know it. Okay? And then these dancers come and they sort of like cause a little distraction. They're like warrior dancers and... And they kind of keep Zeus hidden and in his innocence. And he has this little toy that he plays with, that, which represents wonder and gaiety and uniqueness and innocence until he can grow up, which he does. And then he overthrows his father. Then he kills Kronos. All right. This ought to remind you of the other story. You might say, what the heck does this have to do with trauma? I'll get to it. Here's the second story. Okay, there's a story about a little boy. Um, who's born into, you know, into a family, and there's a dream. And the dream says, hey, um, a child is going to be born, and um, it's a divine birth, and the mother is a virgin here, and she's going to give birth. And, but the thing is, he's going to be a king, and that means that's, there's going to be trouble because that means the existing king is going to be upset about this. Okay? And so anyway, the, the baby's born. And he's wrapped in uh, swaddling clothes and, and laid in a cave in a, in a manger in a horse trough or some kind of animal trough and um, protected away from the evil king. And who's the evil king? The evil king is Herod, who says, hears that one day there's going to be a Messiah that's going to come and overthrow his rule. And so he decides to have all the babies killed. All right. Just like Pharaoh about. A thousand years earlier, according to the book of Exodus, decided to do the same thing. And that little boy of divine birth, divine origin, miraculous some, something, was tucked away, hidden away until they had time to grow up and overthrow the kingdom. So we, when Jesus starts going around saying the kingdom of God is at hand, okay, so now there's trouble. No wonder the authorities are still after him at that point. Have I made sense? Okay. Now, what do these have to do with trauma? So there are several, um, it's like every myth, imagine there's like a, an old-fashioned radio dial, you know, the 
the kind where, with the knobs, and you, you could see it going back and forth. Are you with me? All right. So we're turning the knob. And a myth is like that. You can basically turn it to about 25 different frequencies and hear it on different levels. I'm going to turn it to the frequency of childhood trauma here. Just, just hit, land on that. It's, it's a story about innocence, childhood, wonder, sensitivities, being wounded by the culture, being wounded by the father, and having to go into hiding. The one reason why these myths are so powerful and why people keep telling them is because, be, well, that's only one of about 20 channels, is because once it lands on that channel, it tells us something like, you're not alone. You're not alone. You have a wild innocence. You even have a kind of divine origin, if you want to put it in ancient language. And that sensitivity is likely to get wounded in some way. And a a protective mechanism like hiding away is likely to happen. Now, what's interesting, I got this um, Herod and Zeus business from Donald Kalshed. He's a a Jungian. But he says um, um, what happens is that not only... Can you think about these myths externally, like your childhood home and like the culture in general and what it might do to young people? But what's, what's also the case at the same time is this is also a picture of what goes on internally. So over time, you have a Herod figure that wants to separate you and cut you off from your innocence, from ever feeling this way again, from being vulnerable. So it's like, Zeus is somewhere hidden away and you don't know about it. Have I made sense? So not only can the culture do this to you, but the operating system of trauma raises up these figures like a kind of inner Herod that is that split and says you're not going to feel this way again and can become a kind of tyrant. That's what's kind of scary about it. A kind of violent tyrant that says you'll never feel again. And believe me, when that is operating, you can't talk yourself out of that. Okay? And even having like a friend, no intervention is going to happen. Hey, you know, it's like I'm never going to feel this way again. And, my, and, and it's a matter of life and death to the psyche. And a lot of that is happening unconsciously. Have I made sense analogously with these myths? You're like, what's the no? Okay, so in other words, I'm trying to say these stories are about what happens on the inside as much as what happens on the outside. And these stories are symbols for the harmful forces that that move against our own innocence and vulnerabilities and sensitivities. And they they tell us a great deal about the self-care system is partly what I'm saying. And Herod can be a kind of inner tyrant that sends our innocence into hiding. Um, it also contains some good news because the story is saying that the child can come out of hiding eventually and overthrow the government, you know, overthrow the tyrannical forces that are keeping us from feeling our own vulnerabilities. There's actually something, there's almost nothing more beautiful than when someone later in life rediscovers their own vulnerabilities, emotional depth, innocence, honesty, openness, humor. It's like, they're back. Where did they go all these years? Well, Herod or whatever, or Pharaoh or Kronos was saying, you better stay in your place. Otherwise, you're, go- you're going to get hurt. Okay. Here's how I want to end. I wish, <laughs> this is what I wish. It was like one of those old sermons that was like four steps to healing trauma. I don't have that for you because my, my question is, um, is what do we mean in the first place? And that's, that's the train I'm interested in exploring today. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer some possibilities here. I am going to offer four, four ideas, four points, just so I can try to land the plane, more or less. So the first comes from uh, James Finley. James Finley, he was a student of Thomas Merton in the monastery. And um, he's, he's also a psychotherapist now, and he has a few interesting books and teachings on, on trauma. And he knows what he's talking about because he was very seriously abused when he was a little boy. And what happened to him is he escaped that abuse by going to the church, all right? Never again will this happen to you, so he became a monk. And guess what happened to him in the monastery? 
he was abused by a priest in the monastery. So we're talking about, you know, what is the phrase? Out of the frying pan into the fire. Yeah, so, but it's the self-care system that was coming online says, never again. And here's a place that I've been told, because he was a good Catholic, that there's a good father, and if I simply go there, I'll be protected. And most of this is happening unconsciously. So he didn't know what to do with it, the priest. And he eventually had to leave the monastery. And he didn't even know, it's not like he went away to process it. He didn't even know what was happening to him. In fact, it wasn't until he was um, almost done with graduate school to become a psychoanalyst than when he said all hell broke loose. All right? And it did. And it did. Okay, so here's the image I got from him. Such a powerful image. He says, let's say your childhood was like, like you're in a house. And one day the house caught on fire. Okay, maybe it's big T trauma. The house is like going to be burned to the ground. Or maybe it's little T trauma like your room is on fire. Doesn't matter, the house is on fire, all right? And through the amazing, absolutely amazing capacities of the human being, the human mind, the heart, the body, the psyche, you get out of the house at some point. You make it. You get out of the house and you make it out of the burning building. Some kids don't make it out of the burning building. That is the truth, all right? So you make it out of the burning building and you're standing there on the lawn. And you're like, I made it. It's like amazing. And maybe on the lawn, like you have a family and like you have a job and things go on. And, and, and every once in a while, you look back at the house and you're like, that was the house that I came out of. And then one day you're standing there, he says, one day. <laughs> you're standing there and you look and you see in, in the window, there's a little boy or a little girl. And you like look a little closer and you realize, oh, that's me. And you have to go back into the house because that little boy and that little girl has to come with you. And he says, that's trauma work. That summarizes trauma work. Because what's keeping you protected out here on the lawn, it's like there's, a, there's a, an armor or a coating. And, and trauma work is about penetrating that, returning to the child, not so much to the scene of the crime, but to the child and taking that child by the hand and saying, you can come out on the lawn now. Okay? So that's a, that's a, a metaphor, but I think it's a pretty powerful one. And he says, so you got to get some real help here. Don't trust your friend that went to um, a yoga retreat on trauma as an expert, okay? <laughs> they may have learned some awesome things, all right? And, and believe me, a lot of this stuff is worked out in the body. It's not all just, you know, on the therapeutic couch or in the mind or understanding. So there's definitely a place for these practices that help. But you sometimes need help because going back into a burning building is like serious business, he says. So you need a therapist or a friend or a community that won't abandon you or invade you. And that's what most people do when they're experiencing someone else who's traumatized. They'll run away or they'll invade. They'll say, especially if they're, I'll just pick on a certain gender, a man. And they say, I, I know how to fix this. And they want to get in there. Tell me all the details, you know. Have you tried this? That kind of meddling. And the shield goes up again. Or abandonment, you know. That's what they're afraid of in the first place. So, okay, so it's like a burning building, and you might need some help. Those were two points. Here's three and four. These are PSs. Dreams often give us clues. Now, I don't want to do a whole thing on dreams right now because, you know, Kronos is eating children. Time is ticking. By the way, that's the that's you know Peter Pan thing, the whole clock ticking. That's Kronos tick, 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 eating away our children, eating away our innocence. Okay, okay. Dreams give us clues because many people dream. I'm going to make some generalizations about dream patterns. Many, many, many people dream about babies who are in trouble, kids who are in trouble, kids who are wounded, young people that are wounded, um, animals that are wounded. And oftentimes, that's the psyche saying, pay attention. There's some part of your wounded, cut-off self here, innocence, that needs some attention. So dreams are really, really powerful when it comes to this kind of work. And this is the final PS, unless I think of more. Um, it's a good idea to start paying attention to one's own patterns here. And I, you know, I don't want to go into too much detail, but I'm just going to give you one. 
I guess I'll just take the example of dreaming of wounded animals. So um, Calshed gives an example here of, <clears throat> he said, he, he used to work with a woman. This is in his book, so I'm not like violating, you know, some trust here. Where um, she was like emphatically committed to helping injured animals on the side of the road. Every animal that she saw, she would stop and help and nurse back to life. We'd say, hey, that's a good thing. Like, hey, this, we would say she's very empathetic. But at home, she was a, a ter- like a kind of tyrant toward her husband. So it was like something wasn't quite adding up. And so and then she came to therapy. Like, I, you know, basically I abused my husband. I don't know if that, that came out in the first session, but it came out over time. Yet I have like tremendous empathy, so something's going on. So they're starting to work with this and they're over the course of several years, even to the point where she came in for a session one day and, uh, and she said, I can't even start because I saw a pigeon on, down on the step down below and we need to go take care of it. And so he's like looking at his watch. He's like, well, you're paying for this, you know, all right. So they go down, they help the pigeon, they come back up. So what's happening here over the course of time is a kind of revelation that what's being projected onto these animals is something that she can't quite face on the internal realm. Her own innocence and her own wounds, she can't get anywhere near. So it's coming out in these channels. This happens sometimes with people. So it's interesting to say, what are the things that I'm concerned about? You find this with social justice-oriented people in the first place, very passionately committed to a certain external cause, which you can say is totally valuable and good on one level, but might also reveal something on the deeper level. What wound is being touched is often the question. What wound is being touched? And in a way, it's the psyche attempting to, to put us back together again. If, if they're right, these authors, that we're split, well, what is healing in the most general sense? It's those parts of ourselves coming back home again instead of constantly externalizing it out there. If I fix all the problems out there, um, somehow I'll be magically cured on the inside. And he's trying to bring these two worlds together. So maybe that's as much as I want to say right now. What do we mean by trauma? As I use the word trauma... Trauma is an inner injury, a lasting rupture or split within the self due to difficult or hurtful events. By this definition, trauma is primarily what happens within someone as a result of the difficult or hurtful events that befall them. It is not the events themselves. Trauma is not what happens to you, but what happens inside you is the way I formulate it. Thanks for listening.